We've just witnessed one of the most significant developments on the international stage when it comes to the genocide in Gaza and the horrific crimes that have been committed over the past seven months. On Monday, May 20th, the chief prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, filed arrest warrant applications for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, and three senior Hamas leaders, Yahya Sinwar, Mohammed Leif, and Ismail Haniya. Joining us to speak about the ICC arrest warrant applications and the implications for both the Israeli and Palestinian leaders, as well as the future of the genocide in Gaza, is Hassan ben Imran, a member of the Governing Council of Law for Palestine and a PhD researcher in law at the University of Galway, the Irish Center for Human Rights, Ireland. Hassan coordinated the Genocide Prevention Emergency Action, where 30 lawyers of law for Palestine were dedicated to legal action to pursue the legal mechanisms of genocide prevention and accountability. Hassan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Yumna. It's my pleasure to join. So I want to start off by asking you, as someone who's been involved in seeking justice and accountability, for the Israeli crimes committed across the occupied Palestinian territories, not just in this genocide, but outside of it as well. What was your reaction to the news that the ICC was seeking arrest warrants for figures like Netanyahu and Gallant? I mean, this was a long time in the making. Yeah. So the first reaction was, really? Did it really happen? I was quite Mm -hmm. surprised, to be honest. We have been hearing uh, rumors of these arrest warrants uh, way before they were circulated in the media. Uh, But uh, everyone was quite quite skeptical for why they have not been issued yet, considering that uh, uh, arrest warrants do not usually go through this much of of, uh, ambiguity and and suspense, if I, I could call it so. Uh, in the Ukraine case, in other cases, the arrest warrants were issued smoothly and automatically upon establishing a reasonable ground for the existence of crimes. Uh, so my first initial reaction was positively surprised. I kind of did not believe the news I, until I, I saw the video myself, until I read it, until I started f- having journalists calling me to, to ask me to comment on this. And I was like, oh, so it's <laughs> real. So then I, I called my colleagues. I, sta- I started asking people about the technicalities, the details, because I kind of saw it like 10 minutes later, which is quite late. In in 10 (laughs) minutes, so many things can happen these days. Uh, To be honest, it was a mixture of feelings. On one hand, I was happy that this finally has happened. This has been a very long process that uh, should have taken uh, less time. At the same time, I was kind of, I would say, uh, confused if I could say so, mm-hmm. for why genocide was not inclu- included in the mandate, or in the arrest warrants, why apartheid was not included, why occupation was not mentioned, why nothing that preceded October the 7th was included in the arrest warrants. I felt like, do we really need a genocide for the, for some action to happen on, mm-hmm. the inter- on the ICC, for some arrest warrants that have been expected ever since 2015? Uh, Palestine approached the court uh, first time in 2009. Uh, Palestine then was not a state, according uh, within the GA, the United Nations General Assembly. Then Palestine got the state uh, statehood level, I would say, the non- non-member state uh, in the United Nations. Then in 2015, Palestine approached the court again, and Palestine became a member uh, of the Assembly of State Parties. And ever since, until 2021, uh, the investigation was not initiated. Now the investigation started in 2022, uh, 2021, sorry. Until today, until a genocide took place, nothing happened. So I would say it was a mixture of, of feelings and thoughts, but definitely this is a step in the right direction. This is a historic step. This is something that while it should have happened before, it's still something to be commended that it happened mm-hmm. eventually, despite the pressure that we were familiar with. And I want to get more into the lead up to this action that was taken by the ICC prosecutor and all the years that it's taken to get to this, as you mentioned. But before we do that, let's just take a look at what happens now. So for our listeners, these aren't actual arrest warrants. So those arrest warrants still have to be approved by a pretrial chamber, to my understanding. And that's something that could take several months. So my two questions for you are, 
In your view, what is the likelihood that these arrest warrants are actually approved? And then this moves forward into the next phase. And then if it does move forward and these warrants are issued for these leaders, um, what will happen? How will they be affected? Uh, to my knowledge, there are, there are no precedents for uh, arrest warrants to be overruled by a pre-trial chamber. Okay. Uh, however, uh, there are precedents where uh, precedents in the Darfur case against uh, Sudanese President Omar al Bashir, where uh, the the pre pre trial where the arrest warrants were issued, um, uh, quoting and citing some crimes, but not genocide in particular. Mm-hmm. And then the prosecutor at that time, uh, Ocampo, uh, of the ICC, appealed the decision of the pre pre trial chamber to include. The, the, the crime of genocide to the arrest warrants. So they have been issued, they were issued at that time, but they did not cite genocide. They only cited cited the war crimes and crimes against humanity. That was approved by the pretrial chamber and eventually the crime of genocide was included. So we're expecting that things are supposed to go in the, the, the same usual direction where nothing is challenged. Uh, I, I think if any challenge needs to happen, it should be why genocide was not inclu- included mm-hmm. in, in the um, in the mandate, why apartheid was not included, why occupation, the prolonged occupation was not included, why the settler violence is not included, why the settlements are not included. All mm-hmm. of these are a matter of consensus within the international legal community, especially the, 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 the settlements in the West Bank. Um, and, and the list goes on. If we're not talking about apartheid, at least we're talking about an administrative practice of discrimination and racism. Yeah. So none of this was included. So all of these questions should be challenged actually at some point with with further uh, work with the court, with further pressure on, on including these crimes. I think eventually they will be included because the evidence or the reasonable ground for the existence mm-hmm. of these uh, crimes is, is very well established. So let's take a hypothetical, right? And again, this is for people like myself who aren't well-versed in how international law or these mechanisms work. Let's take a hypothetical. The arrest warrant is issued. So that means that I believe, are there 124 countries that are party to the Rome Statute? 26, if I'm not mistaken. Or it could be okay, so 124, mm-hmm. 100, uh, uh, extremely large amount of countries are party to this statute, including um, many European countries. So let's say an arrest warrant is issued. If Netanyahu or Defense Minister Gallant were then to go to one of these countries that are party to the Rome Statute, then an arrest warrant would be issued for them. Um, again, hypothetical. We're moving, I feel like, way ahead right now. But let's say that they are apprehended. They are arrested in one of these cases. What happens then? Are they brought to trial? Uh, is the investigation then take? Does the investigation then take place? How long would something like that um, take? How long would that take to happen? And is there a precedent for something like that? Yeah. So uh, there are precedents for uh, uh, individuals being handed over to the court. It, it mm-hmm. happened in in. Uh, in, in several cases, in, in uh, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, in other cases, or like not Rwanda, like someone who was in Rwanda at that time, uh, mm-hmm. they were uh, Ongwen, if I'm mistaken, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, they were handed over to the court. So the process uh, procedure goes like this. If any of the, like any state, generally speaking, theoretically speaking, should collaborate with the court, whether or not they are members to the Assembly of State Parties, usually called the ASP. Uh, but Legally speaking, it is only binding on those member states of the Assembly mm-hmm. of State Parties. So if any of these leaders lands in a territory of the ASP, a territory of a member of the ASP, they should be handed over to the court in the Netherlands, specifically in The Hague. And then the trial starts, commences. Before that, these are allegations, accusations founded on the basis of a reasonable basis of evidence, so they are not empty allegations. They are allegations built on the basis of a solid evidence, but mm-hmm. they are not yet convictions. They are not full decisions okay. until the trial happens. So the trial starts the moment these leaders or some of them are handed over to the court. The trials, okay. in many cases, took several years to mm-hmm. be concluded. So it's not expected to be concluded within months, mm-hmm. assuming that a state would hand them over. Uh, I think it was the Norwegian foreign minister yesterday that uh, stated that they they would hand over uh, any leader that lands into their territory, regardless of of, 
uh, of which country they come from, mm-hmm. indicating that if Netanyahu or Gallant are, mm-hmm. are to land in their territory, they would be handing them over to the Netherlands, to the court in the Netherlands, sorry, mm-hmm. uh, where the Hague, uh, where the ICC commences the investigation. Mm-hmm. So now, theoretically speaking and legally speaking, uh, neither Netanyahu nor Gallant can land in any territory that uh, in any country, any member state of the ASP, that includes mm-hmm. most of Europe, that includes Canada, mm-hmm. that includes many Asian African countries, that limits their movement a lot. If that mm-hmm. really happens, it could be deemed as the end of the political life of those leaders because mm. they won't be able the united nations is in geneva and in and new york okay in new york they can attend because the us is not a member of uh, of the court is not a member to the asp but in in within europe it will be quite complicated for them in some cases the court asked the countries not to offer uh in, not, not to allow these leaders to fly over their territory so even mm. the, 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 that also is included in this. Okay. So you, you would include the, also the journey where they would have to fly over the U.S. territory because I think most of the flights would pass by Europe and mm-hmm. most of these European countries are members to the court. So the, the, if, if the law is upheld, if the procedures of the court are upheld, it is a very serious situation for those leaders. So... Let's take a look at the actual charges. You've mentioned this already. Let's take a look at the actual charges that are being lobbied against the Israeli officials first. So I'll just name, I'll name off some of them. Starvation of Gazan civilians as a method of warfare, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury in the besieged enclave, willful killing or murder, intentionally directing attacks against a civilian population, extermination by starvation, persecution, and other inhumane acts committed from at least October 8th, all part of a, quote, widespread and systematic attack against the Palestinian civilian population pursuant to state policy. So these, of course, are serious crimes and violations of international law. I mean, you're talking about starvation, the willful killing uh, or murder of civilians. Um, But some critics, including yourself, say, you know, this is just a drop in the bucket of crimes that Israel as a whole and Netanyahu and Gallant specifically have carried out against Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but all across occupied Palestine. And as you mentioned, some of these bigger crimes, such as genocide, apartheid, occupation, um, these aren't included in the list. So what do you make of this specific list of charges? And then again, to, to what you noted earlier in our conversation, to, to the charges that aren't included in this list. So the charges that have been included are exactly as you may, as uh, you call them a drop in the bucket. Uh, like these are are some of the charges that could be uh, added after October the eighth. Mm-hmm. But some of them, even if we are to start the investigation in October, the charges are much bigger. The accusations, the founded accusations, the allegations that are uh, founded on evidence submitted by several civil society organizations, including Law for Palestine. Uh, are much bigger than that. But if we are to look at the whole situation, uh, ever since Palestine approached the court and became a member, uh, uh, ratified the Rome Statute of the ICC and became a member to the ASP and the court, uh, then we're talking about a very, very uh, limited set of charges, a set of charges that does not uh, convey the actual uh, crimes that have been committed by Netanyahu himself. Netanyahu has been there. All, all along this period, Netanyahu has been the prime minister. Uh, tiny, minor interruptions, but Netanyahu has been the prime minister all along this time. Uh, so there are so many other crimes that are within the mandate of the court that have very well established uh, uh, evidence and legal literature, including apartheid. We're talking about mm-hmm. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, others that have been talking about apartheid. Israeli and Jews are talking about apartheid, despite some disagreement on the, the man, on the scope of this apartheid, whether sure. it includes Palestinians within Israel as well, or only Palestinians in the West Bank or Gaza uh, and Gaza. So after all of this evidence, it, it poses so many questions uh, why these uh, this set of charges was not included to the arrest warrants. And after October the 8th, now we're having a case in the ICJ, the top court of the mm-hmm. United Nations. 
or like the most prestigious court, as, as many jurists call it in the world, where it's talking about a reasonable basis for, or like, a, sorry, a plausible case for genocide, regardless mm -hmm. of what the, the former president of the chamber said uh, in a very ambiguous comment later on, I think, on the BBC. Uh, but the, the court did specifically say that there is a risk for for uh, for prejudice against the rights of the Palestinians to be protected from genocide. So there is a plausible a plausible case for genocide. In the in the later um, provisional measures, I think the ones that were issued in the third uh, request for the provisional measures, the court specifically mentioned that starvation is not is not a risk anymore. It's settling mm -hmm. in. This is a case mm -hmm. for the merits. Now we're talking about something for the merit stage, not for the provisional measures. Provisional measures are an interim order that does not decide on the case or the merits of the case, as we say. But this comment in particular kind of decides for the merits. It's a, it's a decision or it's a comment, it's an observation that relates to the merits. And now we're expecting another provisional measure request, uh, another provisional measure order, sorry. So after all of this recognition of the risk of genocide, and after we're talking about uh, other organizations, the UN, uh, special rapporteurs, the, uh, several UN experts warning continuously about the risk of genocide. Some of them have confirmed it is a case for genocide. The United Nations special rapporteur in Palestine, Francesca Albanese, specifically detailed how the, in, in her report called the anatomy of genocide, mm -hmm. how what's happening in Gaza is an act of genocide. After all this, and after all of this evidence and the intent established by several organizations, we submitted to the court close to 600 genocidal statements. Half of them are by the leaders of Israel, not by the, 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 the journalists only, not by the doctors, not by the population, by the leaders, the ones who decide for how, how, how the, the war is run in Gaza. So after all of this evidence has been established, it poses so many questions for why this set of charges, why genocide is not included in the in the arrest warrants. In the Bashir case, the one I mentioned earlier, the Darfur case, uh, the court, when they refused to add the crime of genocide to the arrest warrants order, they cited that it's not the only reason, it's not the only conclusion to be drawn. So this is the, the threshold that they adopted to de exclude the crime of genocide. So they said the statements can be inferred to mean something else. Then the prosecutor appealed and insisted that this threshold is only at the trial stage. For the stage of arrest warrants, it's enough to uh, confer, it's enough to conclude that this is a reasonable basis. So it does mm -hmm. not have to be the only conclusion to be drawn. It has to be one of the conclusions to be drawn. And nobody can dispute that this is one of the conclusions. If mm -hmm. not, the only conclusion to be drawn from 600 statements from sure. these are human animals, citing Amalek, so on and so forth. So to conclude uh, my observation on this, um, I would say that uh, this is a good first step. It is something that should have happened. It has happened finally. The set of crime is definitely not con uh, uh, conclusive. It's definitely missing so many major elements, so many major crimes, but it's not too late. Procedurally, legally, there is still time to correct this mistake. And mm -hmm. I would confidently call it a mistake. Uh, and include these crimes against again. Thank you. It's not just the Israeli leaders, though, that were named in this um, application for the arrest warrants by by the ICC prosecutor. On the other hand, we also have a long list of charges that are being brought against the Palestinian leaders of Hamas. So for those for the listeners who don't know, the Hamas leaders that were named by the ICC are Yahya Sinwar, who's the head of Hamas in Gaza, Mohammed Leif, the commander and chief of Hamas's military wing, and Ismail Haniya, the head of Hamas's political arm. Among the charges against them are as follows, extermination, murder, hostage taking, yeah. rape and other acts of sexual violence, torture, cruel treatment, outrages upon personal dignity and other inhumane acts. I wanna ask you, what has been the reaction of Palestinians to these charges against Hamas officials and, and the equivalency, um, you know, that's being made between the 
Israeli leaders that are carrying out this genocide in Gaza and these Hamas leaders. I mean, we can get to what Netanyahu's had to say. He's had a lot to say about the this equivalency that's being drawn. And he's really upset about him and other quote unquote leaders of democracy being named in the same case as quote unquote terrorist leaders. But what what's the reaction of Palestinians to to these accusations and these charges being lobbied against the Hamas officials? Uh, to my knowledge, I've been following the, the legal aspect of this case, but sure. to my knowledge, the Palestinians in general are welcoming this decision of all throughout the Palestinian political spectrum. Uh, you would need to ask uh, experts on, on this uh, sure. topic, on, on, the, on the political reaction, but um, uh, from what I see, Palestinians in general want accountability, regardless of, 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 of uh, uh, any issues that come along with it. So uh, what I can say th- is that the Palestinians are very happy about the arrest warrants, very happy about the decision. Yes, they are not happy about the fact that the arrest warrants were not conclusive, uh, mm-hmm. were, were, they were lacking so many major uh, elements of the crimes. But I can see that, that uh, there is a positive atmosphere uh, surrounding this. Uh, but there is... On, on this uh, note, uh, the Palestinian uh, ambassador to the UK and former ambassador to, to the US, uh, Hossam Zumluk, mentioned something in an interview that I'm yet to, to, to verify personally, uh, that uh, when Palestine approached the court in 2015, uh, the state of Palestine, which is sometimes called the PA, which mm-hmm. is, you, in, for many people, it's controlled by Fatah. Party, which mm-hmm. is the political opponent of Hamas. So mm-hmm. when they approached the, the ICC, before they submit the request to open to start the investigation, they collected signatures from the heads of all Palestinian factions. And mm-hmm. he reiterated that the first signature was the signature of Hamas. Mm-hmm. That's something he reiterated, that, that Palestinians, including Hamas in Gaza, were um, trying to have the court interfere in this uh, manner. But as yeah. for the general uh, reaction, I think uh, that that's all I managed to see in, in the sure. previous few days. Well, I mean, to, to your point, to the point that you just made, I mean, there's an article here from January 17th, yeah. 2015 by Reuters um, saying that Hamas welcomes the ICC inquiry into the yeah. Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, and that uh, Hamas has said that... Um, yeah, they welcome ICC prosecutors and any preliminary examination um, into any crimes committed within the occupied Palestinian territories, which would implicate Hamas officials. Of course, that was before October 7th, but that sort of sentiment stood from the very beginning, whereas from the beginning of when these proceedings started or when um, these the investigation, the preliminary investigation was opened, which was almost 10 years ago at this point, um, Palestinian leaders, including Hamas, welcomed it, knowing that it could also implicate them. But we've also seen over the years um, Israel's staunch opposition to any ICC investigation um, and and attempts to sort of block it at, at every turn, which is something I wanted to ask you about. In, in many of Netanyahu's responses to um, the recent application for arrest warrants by the ICC prosecutor. Um, he's also said that, you know, uh, well, they the ICC prosecutor hasn't come, you know, to Israel. He hasn't spoken to people. He hasn't done his due diligence um, in, in this investigation or whatever has happened. Um, what do you make of that? Or what's your response to that sort of knowing how Israel has treated these mechanisms of international law and international accountability, whether it be the ICC, the ICJ, the UN, and how it's blocked a lot of these bodies and mechanisms at, at every turn over the past several years and decades. Yeah. Uh, for Israeli leaders and the general atmosphere in Israel, these courts are, are uh, some sort of a social construct. Mm. The only thing that is solid is their rights, what they perceive as their rights. They truly see Israel as, as a, an entity above the law. So to them, any entity that was created following the Second World War, uh, World War is, is a marginal entity. This is an entity that has been created for the world, for the rest of the world, not for 
us for Israel. Like, who are you in that sense to come and question me and or my actions? And I'm not um, making this up, or I'm I'm not even citing experts. I'm citing Netanyahu himself. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the 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 before the arrest warrants were issued, he recorded a video in his office, and then released it on his social media accounts, saying that these institutions were founded to protect us in that sense. And by us, he was talking. He was claiming to represent. Jewish people all over the world, which mm-hmm. I, I don't think is an accurate thing. We all know how this is inaccurate. So he's saying that these institutions were founded to protect us, and now they are coming after us. I mean, like, he, he was trying to, to be sarcastic, or like to, to be funny, if I can uh, use that word, while describing the, the, the actions of the court towards them. So Israel does not see that these institutions were created to hold them accountable. These institutions are created to protect them, to, to uh, facilitate, to, to serve them, to help them in that sense. And this is not something related to Netanyahu. This has been the case all along Israeli political uh, life. It included cabinets or governments created by the left, by the mm-hmm. Labour Party that committed several war crimes and crimes against humanity. So there is an understanding within the Israeli political elite that we are above the law. Nobody can touch us. We have the United States having our back. So whatever we do, we can get along with it. Now that the courts are coming after us, many of them are still confident that none of this would actually materialize. None of this would happen. While on the Palestinian side, uh, the general atmosphere is that we want some accountability. We don't know how this accountability will look like. We are unsure about many of its details, but something has to happen. It's already gone. I mean, like the Rubicon has been crossed, as they say it. Gaza mm-hmm. was supposed to be in, in, uninhabitable by 2020, according to mm-hmm. several UN reports, according to several uh, HRC reports as well, Human Rights Council's report. Yet, 2022, 2020 came, COVID came to, to, to add the cherry on the top of the, 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 the cake. Nothing happened. People continued surviving. Then the, the explosion happened. So we're talking about a very devastating situation making Palestinians okay with any solutions that would come, even if they are not uh, sufficiently just and fair. Yeah. And to go further into the reaction that we've yeah. seen from Netanyahu and the U.S., I mean, and, and other, you know, allies of Israel, unsurprisingly, the U.S., Israel, and others have responded to this ICC decision to pursue arrest warrants by lobbying a number of accusations, not just against the court, but also against uh, prosec- the prosecutor con as well. So the U.S. called the decision, quote, outrageous. Uh, some Republican lawmakers have said that they were going to seek sanctions against the prosecutor and the court. Netanyahu's come out in full force against this, as we've spoken about a little bit. He's called it anti-Semitic. He's calling Khan a rogue prosecutor. He's claiming that Israel has acted with moral fortitude, actually, and has done everything possible to respect international law in Gaza. And, you know, this has been a consistent talking point, not just since October, but even before that. In an interview recently with CNN's Jake Tapper, Netanyahu claimed that people in Gaza aren't actually starving. Um, as the, the the application for arrest warrants stated. And he said that Israel has actually been sending aid into Gaza, not preventing it. And he even somehow implied that the genocide has had some positive effects for Gaza. And he said he claimed that the price of produce in Gaza has actually gone down since the start of the war. So, I mean, this sort of deflection, in addition to it being so outrageously comical in, in some regards, it's not unexpected from Netanyahu and from other Israeli officials, right? But when you peel back this facade of, you know, feigned indignation at these accusations and all the usual talking points from the Israeli government, are we actually seeing someone who is ultimately very concerned about what is happening or even scared or, or terrified by, by the implications that this could have? For him, I mean, you said at the beginning that, you know, this could technically spell the end of, you know, his political career or, you know, future as a political figure um, in Israel. So I'm, I'm curious what you think of that. I think regardless of what Netanyahu is saying, he definitely feels the pressure. He definitely feels it's a very serious situation, unfortunately, for political reasons, not reasons related to the to the 
restaurants themselves. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go off topic too much, but um, sure. again, Israel knows that Israel, and again, I insist on on speaking of Israel regardless of Netanyahu. Netanyahu mm-hmm. is, is not is not the worst person we can imagine to lead the cabinet. Believe me, we, 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 there are way worse leaders that are to come when once Netanyahu has been re- is removed. Uh, we have seen that. We, we have seen the nice ones with a bow tie, such as uh, the, the, the several leaders, including Rabin himself, including Rabin, the, 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 the Nobel Prize winner. Like he has been involved in crimes, in crimes that the UN documented in the 80s. Mm-hmm. He, he, was a, he came from a military background. So th- there is nothing new. It's just that Netanyahu is more clear. He makes it mm-hmm. easier to quote. You know, it, it, it makes it really easy to quote and cite, you know, in the, the, his own motivations. So uh, Netanyahu is seriously worried, not about the courts taking action about him, but about the U.S. feeling that he's a liability. Mm-hmm. He started to realize that the U.S., including Trump himself, not just Biden, like even if Trump comes back to power, Netanyahu is sensing that the U.S. political elite, the potential candidates for presidency, are feeling that he is a li- liability as a person. So if they see a substitute for him, they would be very glad to replace him. And if that happens, it's it's having the arrest warrants applied against him becomes a possibility. At the end, he's not leaving the state anymore. Actually, it sounds very convenient for uh, for the U.S. that uh, Netanyahu is, is to be blamed for the whole thing, because this way they can continue their support for Israel. Israel can continue the genocide, whether the silent genocide or the active loud genocide, regardless mm-hmm. of which form of genocide Israel continues with. Th- that makes it easier for the U.S. to continue funding Israel without having encampment in universities, on campuses, without having all of that pressure, without having 15 people behind blinking calling him more criminal a few days ago. Like, they don't want that. So the best mm-hmm. way is to replace Netanyahu. Netanyahu is feeling that, and that's worrying him. It's mm. not the law or the, the institutions of the law. It's not the courts that are really scaring him, because he knows deep down if the U.S. does not disown him, he's going to be protected somehow. Yeah. He has seen this in several cases, and he thinks that if he continues as prime minister, he will continue to be protected. And I think the point that you made is really important to emphasize that, you know, we're talking here about Netanyahu because he's one of two people so far uh, of Israeli officials who have been named um, to to have arrest warrants issued against them. But it's not about Netanyahu, despite all the attempts, even by the U.S., by U.S. officials to frame this as, you know, Netanyahu's war or Netanyahu's crimes or whatever it is. At the end of the day, this is about Israel. This is about crimes that Israeli leaders across the political spectrum from the beginning of Israel's history as a state up until today, crimes that have been committed against against Palestinians, against the Palestinian people. So I think Yes, it's it's incredibly important to to remember that and to contextualize that for people, and that that has been re-emphasized in some of the other reactions from Israeli leaders to this ICC decision. I mean, we've seen just in the past few hours uh, responses from I believe it was from uh, Yoav Gallant, the defense minister who is named in this this ICC decision, saying that. Um, essentially reneging on the 2005 disengagement deal uh, where Israel pulled out of the settlements in Gaza, saying that Israelis can enter the northern uh, West Bank areas that have been, um, that were evacuated after the 2005 disengagement. Mm -hmm. We saw statements from Bezalel Smotrich, the extreme far right, um, finance minister in Israel directly responding to the ICC decision and to to Palestine's bid uh, to to become a state as well, um, saying that we're going to impose more sanctions on the Palestinian Authority. We're going to um, not release, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenues. We're also going to, in direct response to this, we're going to promote more settlement expansion in the occupied West Bank. Um, settlements that are clearly illegal under international law, in which you noted these are things you know that weren't even noted in in the ICC list of charges against Netanyahu and Gallant. So, just the the reaction of Israeli politicians and leaders um, to this decision 
shows and reinforces this mentality that you mentioned earlier, that Israel is above the law and the law doesn't apply to them. And so that this has just shown sort of the callous disregard for international law, um, not just since October, but but from before that as well. Definitely, definitely. And and one issue that I forgot to mention earlier, but I remembered it as you were uh, talking, Yumna. Uh, Gantz, a member of the World Cabinet, Mm-hmm. He 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 was a candidate to become the prime minister of Israel at some mm-hmm. point. He's a member of the war cabinet, and his name was not included in the arrest warrants. Many people started asking and wondering why Gantz, who individually traveled to the U.S. and met with the U.S. leaders, and his name has been circulated as the future prime minister of Israel, and who's a member of the war cabinet, and who has made genocidal statements, just like you have Gallant, just like Benjamin Netanyahu, just like these two guys. He's as involved as them. If these guys are accused of criminal acts, this guy is to be accused of criminal acts. They can't have done whatever they have done without him. The the cabinet would have collapsed. So Gantz is a major part of the triangle. Mm -hmm. Let go of others. Let go of Smotrich and Pinguir and others. So why many people are wondering, why is Gantz not included? Mm -hmm. Many people are are asking the court, demanding that the court explains why someone whose name was used as the future prime minister of Israel was not included in the arrest warrants. Some people are claiming that this is an arrangement uh, to to, to keep someone for the uh, post-Netanyahu scenario. But I think the court can avoid this easily by either including his name again mm-hmm. in the arrest warrants or explaining, legally speaking. Uh, here we're not talking about a political uh, uh, salon or a, a political dis- conversation. Here it's a conversation governed by the law. And here I'm talking about the Rome Statute and the procedures of the court along with the precedents of the court, the case law of the court. So the conversation is limited. The epistemology of the conversation is quite controlled. It's not going to be a chaotic justification. Mm-hmm. So the court is expected to justify why his name was not included or include him directly. Because Mm -hmm. I'm sure there is no legal reason that justifies excluding someone that was a major part of this triangle. Gallant, Netanyahu, uh, and Gantz. Uh, So uh, Israel does feel that it is above the law. Something like this, something like excluding Gantz, reinforces this idea that yes, one individual might be sacrificed, but not the whole genocidal system. So mm-hmm. Gantz would come. Gantz speaks better than Netanyahu. He is less right-wing than Netanyahu, at least to, to for, for the taste of, of uh, international observers. He does not look as extremist as Netanyahu. While in uh, in practicality, in, in, in action, he's, he's doing the same job. Gantz is, is continuing with the apartheid system. Gantz, Gantz is, would be very happy to continue this war until 50, 60,000 people are killed. Gantz never challenged any of the major violations Israel is doing, is committing. Not the settlements, not the situation in East Jerusalem, not the prolonged occupation, not starving Gaza, not the siege of Gaza. None of this has been challenged by Gantz. It's actually the opposite. None of this would have happened if Gantz decides to leave the cabinet. None of this would have happened. The war would stop if Gantz decides to leave. So yes, Israel does feel that it is above the law, and this does not come uh, uh, out of their own imagination. It comes from their own actual observation and their track in history with the world, that they can do something and get along with it. This has happened over and over again. It's clear from, you know, what you've just said and from our entire conversation, you know, talking about how, okay, this is a good first step, but there's a lot lacking when it comes to the individuals that are missing, like Benny Gantz, for example, who's part of the war cabinet. And there's also a long list of charges that are missing as well against Israeli officials from genocide to apartheid to occupation. These sorts of missing pieces, let's say, coupled with the fact that this preliminary investigation into crimes in the occupied Palestinian territories began almost 10 years ago. Um, during that time, Gaza has been bombed a handful of times, even before this last genocide, this latest genocide. Thousands have been killed in the occupied West Bank. Illegal settlements have continued to expand. 
Um, all of this begs the question of, you know, why has this taken so long? And why is the court or why is the prosecutor choosing to focus just on October 8th and later? Because that date specifically was mentioned in the charges against Israeli officials. Um, what kind of politics, if anything, are at play here at the ICC? Or what do you see as the reasons for these missing pieces? So short answer is uh, politics. Yeah. Only, only politics can explain why this has taken nine years. We're approaching mm-hmm. the, the, the 10th year, actually, so we can say it's 10 years. Sure. The long, uh, the long answer, uh, and I'll try my best not to go into legal technicalities, but the long mm-hmm. answer is that uh, Palestine approached the court initially in 2009. That's almost uh, like 15 years ago, if my math are correct. Uh, Palestine was denied access to the court, was not able to ratify the Rome Statute, the founding document of the court, because Palestine at that time was not a state or recognized as a state within the UN. Uh, though, Although the, the, the court is not actually uh, related to the system of the UN organically, it's not just it's not like the, IC, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, but somehow it's related. So Palestine in 2012 approached the court to approach the, the General Assembly, the, the United Nations Security Council, it failed, so it went to the General Assembly, and it became a state, a non-member state, but still it's called a state. So it's not a member because the, the Security Council did not approve its membership. Basically, we're talking about the U.S. veto. Sure. Uh, but, but the General Assembly recognized Palestine. I think 136 states recognized Palestine as a state. After that, Palestine started preparing itself to approach the court again. A few years later, in 2015, they approached the court. They, they lodged an application to become a member, to ratify the Rome Statute and become a member to the court, and then request a preliminary investigation throughout the territory of the state of Palestine and an investigation that includes everything within the mandate of the court. It was such a very general, inclusive uh, uh, request lodged by Palestine intentionally so that the court applies its own regulations, its own legal uh, legal tests on the situation in Palestine and does not exclude anything. However, Palestine entered into the corridors of, of procedural technicalities of is Palestine a state for the purposes of the Rome Statute or not? And, and this took like two to three years. So like tens of applications, tens of amicus curiae submissions have been made to the court. Uh, the Czech Republic, so many states were, uh, were submitting documents whether to argue that Palestine is or is not a state according to the, uh, the, for the purposes of the Rome Statute. And one question that we could not find an answer, where every ex- expert has been asked that, why was Palestine accepted within the ASP? the Assembly of State Parties, if it's not a state for the purposes of the Roman Statute. So this is a question that has been settled in 2015. Yet in 2019, 2020, and even 2021, this has been discussed within the court. Is Palestine a state or not? I mean, even if Palestine is not a state, the prosecutor has jurisdiction, proprio motto. Like the, the prosecutor can announce that he or she, at that time it was Fatou Ben Soda, she could have announced that she could start investigation even without Palestine applying to the court. The court mm-hmm. can have that, that capacity. The court has that jurisdiction. Yet Palestine was made to go into these legal technicalities and legal procedures. At the end, the court said, yeah, oh, yes, Palestine is mm-hmm. actually a state for the purposes of the Roman Statute. Six years after it already accepted Palestine within the ASP. Like it was very surreal, very uh, unexplainable, inexplicable by by. So many, like so many legal grounds. Like we, we okay. tried to make sense of why this came six years after it already was admitted to the ASP. Uh, some people were speaking about the lack of control. I think it was the Czech Republic, on behalf of Israel, say, saying that uh, Palestine lacks effective control over the territory of of uh, the West Bank, and hence they cannot uh, uh, delegate their own jurisdiction to the court because they have to mm-hmm. delegate their own domestic jurisdiction to the court since they lack themselves this jurisdiction. But again, no other case faced this. 
nobody had to deal with all these legal games that lawyers mm-hmm. enjoy. Me, if I were to detach myself from this case, I would enjoy it. It's, it's so much fun. Okay. Legal technicalities, it's, it's the game of people within mm-hmm. the legal field. It's, it's sure. something that they enjoy. But once you remember that this legal game actually means 30,000 people dead, means yeah. 5 million people within apartheid system, means that people unable to go for medical facilities, people, mm-hmm. basically people not living as people, people living mm-hmm. as, as lesser humans. Uh, so th- these legal games are, are not something that is done in a moot court. It's actually done to decide on the fate of humans, actual humans, people living there. I'm sure you, Yumna, you can visualize this from your own of experience. Course, yeah. Where these, the results of these fun games that lawyers enjoy and lawyers within mm-hmm. the court somehow enjoyed actually affected the life of people. Mm-hmm. Nobody can deny that even if these arrest warrants are not completely applied, nobody can deny that it exerts serious pressure and mm-hmm. it influences the actions of leaders, whether directly, mm-hmm. automatically or indirectly over, the, over, over the, uh, the course of some time. But eventually it does create pressure and this pressure saves la- human lives. This pressure might allow someone to go to a medical facility without which he or she would lose their lives. Mm-hmm. So w- we're talking about actual serious consequences of these, uh, of these procedural games that have been mm-hmm. played with the state of Palestine over the course of six years. I want to end on that note by asking you, you know, you talk about the fact that at the end of the day, through all these legal proceedings, decades of legal proceedings and politics um, and biases and whatever it may be, people are being killed. People are being subjected to brutal military occupation, to apartheid systems, and now to a genocide. 40, it's estimated 40,000 at least, potentially much more, have been killed in Gaza over the past seven, now almost eight months. There's still a lot to be done, clearly, right? There's still missing pieces of the puzzle to be filled in when it comes to the ICC or the ICJ or whatever court it may be. Where does this leave Palestinians in Gaza? Is there a hope in your eyes for justice, for accountability, and for lives to be saved? Uh, you know, Yumna, the, when the news were circulated about this, uh, I received a few messages from a couple of friends in Gaza. One of them is a lawyer. The other person is not someone that, that is interested in any legal uh, mechanisms. Mm-hmm. Both of them they were, were quite uh, quite excited. They were not quite hopeful, but they were happy. They said, oh, mm-hmm. somebody is, is noticing that we're humans. That was the comment of one of my friends. So actually, people in Gaza are happy about the court taking action. And I felt this mixture of feeling that I want to tell them that, yes, we will continue pushing for that. Hopefully something will happen out of this. But on the other hand, another part of me was like, don't expect too much. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and this is someone that has lost his house. He's separated from his uh, wife because of the, the bombing. Like she has to stay with her family. He has to stay with his family. They're trying to, to settle things. Like they're going through serious like, like they're not living. Their, their life is on hold, complete on hold. Mm-hmm. They're living within a simulation, a, a saddest simulation yeah. uh, that they hope is is, temp- is going to be temporary. So I had this mixture of feeling that I couldn't explain that, yes, we, we should be hopeful, the court should do something, but at the same time I was like, yeah, but there are so many obstacles. I could not express any of that. So people in Gaza are actually happy about this decision. Mm-hmm. At least that their pain is recognized. The least mm-hmm. of it is that their pain, maybe no accountability will happen in the lifetime of Benjamin Netanyahu. Maybe. We don't know. There are many mm-hmm. criminals out there. So many criminals. I've been to Cambodia. I've been to many countries where criminals as bad as, as, as Netanyahu have gone away with it. So mm-hmm. that, that's a possibility. But at least for these victims, for people that lost their, their direct family members, their houses, people that are counting the days, they think that they're going to be next. This guy thinks he's going to be next. He, he has mm-hmm. explicitly mentioned it. So it, at least they feel that their pain is recognized somewhere, somewhere in a serious legal body, uh, that, that their pain is recognized. But I would conclude with 
saying something to the audience uh, who are listening to this, that we should not sit and wait for the court to decide justice. Mm -hmm. Justice throughout history was not decided by courts. Colonialism mm -hmm. was legal over the course of 100 years, 200 years. Colonialism was legal, was not illegal, an illegal act. It was legalized within the, the League of Nations, the organization preceding the United Nations, and the UN inherited the legal regime of the League of Nations. It, it codified colonialism somehow. How did the plight of Palestine start? Through the British mm -hmm. mandate over Palestine. That was a legal mandate. Some scholars now are, are revising the legality of the British actions, but Britain, according to the law of the League of Nations, paved the way for all of this somehow. The government of Great Britain at that time. So we should pursue legal mechanisms. We should keep pushing. We should try to seek as much justice as possible out of them. But we should be very aware that so many unpleasant stories within human history happened within the legal mandate or happened according to the law. Colonialism is just one of them. Slavery is another case. It was a legal act. Nobody was a criminal for being a, a slave owner at that at some point of time. The encampments in the U.S. campuses probably had a similar impact, like the ICC arrest warrants. Mm -hmm. Well, Hassan bin Imran of the Law for Palestine organization, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Yumna.